Hey everybody, Dan Schinder here with Stephen Schinder. And we are here to celebrate GTR. Let's enjoy Phil Spaulding, the late Phil Spaulding, the with his backup band, Jonathan Luther, Steve Hackett, and Steve Howell. Take it, we'll be right with you. Remembrance notes to fellow artists, um, and and it's unfortunately a good reason to celebrate GTR. We've never even brought up GTR on our show, right, Steve? Right. So we've never actively discussed possibly doing an episode on GTR, but I feel like we probably always knew deep down that we would cover them at some point. I think the closest we got is just talking about them a little bit when we had Steve Hackett on our show last August. Right, right. And for those who don't know, if you're new to the show, we're going to apologize for everything you'll ever experience with us ahead of time. But we are a father-son show. Steve's, I'm the father, Steve's the son. Yes. And uh, we, are, we are huge Yes fans. I've been a Yes fan since 1971, and I've seen them almost every tour since 1978. I became friends with Alan White in 1989. Steve was born literally listening to Yes music. And we talked about it so much, we decided, hey, let's do a podcast or a vlog. So here we are. And um, we have interviewed both Steve Howe and Steve Hackett on the show. And um, it, it is kind of funny that this is bubbling up now. So where do you want to start, Steve? Right. So, well, first off, we... Yeah, so Phil Spaulding, of course, passed away earlier this week. Um, we don't know how, but there have been some nice remembrances. So I think we should go ahead and start by reading these quotes we have here from a few yeah. uh, musicians, let's, prominent names. So, yeah. Let's take turns reading them. And, folks, when I look over here, I'm not watching the Flintstones like when we interviewed Bill Bruford. I'm actually looking at a few notes. Right. <laughs> Uh, so do you want to go first or should I go first? Uh, go ahead and kick it off, Steve. Okay. So this one from oh, Jeff wait. Down. What? If, if you're a GTR fan, folks, chime in. Chime into the comments and tell us if you're a GTR fan. Did you ever see them live? What's your favorite album? What's your favorite song? You know, chime in. Be part of the show, please. Contribute. Yeah. So the first one uh, is a quote from Jeff Downs who said, Sad to hear of the passing of Phil Spaulding, a very talented bass guitarist and all-around great guy who I had the pleasure of working with on the GTR albums and several other projects. So, yeah, Jeff Downs was a producer on the GTR album. And, right. Uh, and also, he was one of the producers on Mike Oldfield's uh, 1987 album, Islands, and Phil was one of the musicians on that as well. Yeah, and I have I have a comment about that in a moment, but first I have to tell you what an idiot your father is. Ready? Oh, I think I f I know what you mean. But yeah, sure. we're, we are live, but I accidentally went live on the Drum Talk TV page. Yeah, so I just uh, shared it. Just uh, shared over to Yes, yes Shift. Shift. Yeah. Okay, sorry, folks. Follow us at Yes Shift on Facebook or at Yes Shift on YouTube or yeah. at anchor.fm slash yes, Jeff. Sorry about that, Steve. I was in such a hurry. I finished a meeting right before we started. So the thing about Jeff Downs producing them, what, what I think of, and I don't want to detract from our tribute to Phil, but I just want to mention right. this. I wonder how much Jeff learned from working with Trevor Horn, who became one of the biggest producers in music ever. And I wonder if he ran this music by him, I wonder if he ever deferred to some advice. I wonder if he 
got with him to say, look what I did, my first thing I produced. You know, I think that would be an interesting conversation to have with Jeff, being that, as far as I know, it's the first thing that he produced. Right. I'm, I don't know for certain if it is, but yeah, we're just so used to him just being in the keyboard role. But yeah, yeah. You, there's like a making of GTR half hour documentary, which I was able to see on YouTube and oh, you see him like working with them and it's, it's pretty interesting stuff. Oh, that's cool. And, and not to call you out, son, well, let's give Jeff a little more credit from being just a keyboard player, just an amazing songwriter oh, yeah. uh, partner to John Wayne, but I know what you mean. I'm yeah, saying I, I so meant no like, else bags that's on not you. the only thing he does, but yeah. it's a huge thing. Yeah. yeah. And again, I'm, I'm saying that's so no one else bags on you, but Steve, Howe, yeah. Steve, Howe said uh i'm very sad to hear of our dear old friend phil spaulding has passed away we'd been in touch recently so it came as to everyone as a tragic shock what a player bass and guitar with vocals from heaven with his unforgettable personality and charm he'll greatly be missed bless you phil very nice words from the great steve howe yeah and we also got one from Steve Hackett, who said, I'm sad to hear of the death of Phil Spaulding. He was a lovely guy and a great bass player in GTR. He was also at school with my brother, John. So that's an interesting little connection. Yeah, there. that is. Uh, I, I didn't realize that he was even in that age range, unless maybe Steve's brother is is a lot younger. I don't know. I'm just kind of hypothesizing, but Toya Wilcox says my deepest sympathy to Phil Spaulding's family and loved ones. He was one of the greatest bass players and performers of all time. It's a sad time. Mm. Yeah. And this one from fish, uh, said I could never not forgive his smiling face and he never did me any wrong ever. He was a good friend to many, as well as being one of the finest bass guitarists I've ever known. A true character, a wee wizard, and a wonderful guy. So yeah. I personally never saw them. Um, when we get to their their album tracks, I'll chime in on what my favorite song was. I'd love for you to do that. You've taken a very quick recent deep dive into their music and their legacy and and like you said the making of and all that and i would love for the fans to do that but why don't you give some context for G there's probably a lot of young people around <laughs> your age that never heard of gtr but before you do i, I want to mention something gtr is the abbreviation for guitar and what was oh it is <laughs> i'm kidding i knew that <laughs> <laughs> what was unique about gtr when they came out is that even though they had a touring keyboardist, which we'll get to, there were no keyboards on the album. And the sounds that you hear that do sound like synthesizers or keyboards were actually uh, special, specially processed guitars that Steve Hackett and Steve Howe used. So it was Phil Spaulding, Jonathan Mover on drums, and uh, Steve Hackett on Steve Howe on guitar and guitar, respectively. And, and so that <laughs> was kind of what made them different. And, you know, Steve Hackett from Genesis, Steve Howe from Yes. I mean, just and, uh, when when they came out, it was like <gasps> it was a big gasp. You know, this is post Asia, post Genesis, of course, for Steve Hackett. But why don't you give a little more context? Yeah. So this was very much a moment in time and it was the 80s. Steve Howe had left Asia after their second album and the shows after that. So he left in 1984. Right. Um, side note, it's kind of interesting that like recently I got to watch the Asia and Asia concert and then the GTR live thing. And it's like, all I need to do is watch the ABWH video and I complete the, the Steve trilogy. Howe 1980s trilogy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's awesome. Yeah, but um, so Steve Howe wanted to form a new group and Steve Hackett was looking for something as well. So through Brian Lane, they were able to like get together and uh, sort of start something. And Hackett's most recent solo album was uh, August 1984's Till We Have Faces. And, you know, he wanted a vehicle to keep himself in the public eye. Um, and he knew of vocalist Max Bacon from the band Nightwing, uh, not to be confused with a DC Comics character who came a bit later. Um, 
and Jonathan Mover was like apparently like hounding Hackett to audition him and Jonathan also recommended Phil Spaulding. So there's that connection there. You know, it's it really interesting is how about sometimes you know. things come about and fall into place from a connection to a connection to a ne- connection to a connection, you know? Yeah. And there's especially a lot of that when it comes to musicians who are well-known in prog rock. I tend to notice. It's but, kind yeah. of one big family in a lot of ways, especially within a given 10, 15 year period. There's a lot of new people in the last 10 years um, on the scene in regards to modern neo prog, but those older guys and girls, and we've had a lot of them on our show, they all knew each other, went to go see each other play, then ended up performing with each other or recording with each other. It's, it's quite a small circle actually. Yeah. Um, and I see, uh, I'll just read a couple of comments real quick. I see Jonathan Salas says hi from Brazil. Stephen Dodd says greetings from Somerville, Georgia, and also adds rest in peace, Bird Bacharach. Yeah, he I saw that. passed away today. Yeah. Yeah, composer. Um, the thing I probably know best from him that he contributed to is Raindrops Keep Falling on Raindrops My Head. Raindrops Keep Falling on My yeah. Head. Yeah. <laughs> Grandma loved that song. She loved Bird Bacharach. Yeah. Um, so getting back to the context, um, I should mention Jonathan Mover had also been the drummer on the first two Marillion albums. So right. that was, in, you know, a prog rock band that started in the 80s, fairly new. Yeah. Uh, and he and Fish had some differences. And then June 1985 saw the release of their first post-Mover studio album, Misplaced Childhood. With Ian so, Moses on drums, who we've had on Trump Talk TV. Right. Yeah. So that's another thing that was going on around that time. Um, and during this time, uh, I actually read this in Steve Howe's autobiography, All My Yesterdays. Uh, Steve Howe turned down a $75, or $75, $75,000 offer to provide overdubs for the next Asia album as the material didn't speak to him. And uh, I think he said like some of it sounded like too sad in places, like in terms of the tone of the songs. Um, and this, of course, became Astro, which would be released at the end of November 1985. So that was the first Asia album without Steve Howe. On. Get up and go! Oh, yeah. sorry. <laughs> That's my favorite song, I think, on the album now. Yeah. Uh, I, like- I was shattered when he left Asia. Oh, and, yeah? And, yeah. And, and I don't think Carl's on that album. Am I correct? I'm pretty sure he is. So then um, he's not on the next one, the drummer from Crocus eventually. But yeah, when he, it was almost like, ah, do I even want to listen to that? Because Asia to me was like, there are no other Beatles. Yeah, I know Pete best, but once Ringo joined, we know the Beatles as the Beatles. To me, the Asia was Asia. It wasn't like meant to be no bands are. An institution like Yes or Jethro Tull, where it's a, constant revolving door and it was like when he left it was like "Eh, that'll never be the same i don't know um still some great music but just my personal little sensibilities there yeah um and jeff downs uh you know we talked about how he produced the gtr album he also co-wrote the song the hunter which Mm -hmm. was one of their singles from this album um and hackett wanted to invest in the equipment but Hal believed an expensive studio was the way to go, um, and the band would eventually go in debt. Uh, I got this from an interviews uh, right. interview with uh, Steve Hackett uh, from like the early '90s. Um, and though Hackett and Hal had gone in with the idea of having the band sound like a mix of Yes, Genesis, and Asia, it sounded more like Asia than either of the others you know more kind of aor or arena rock than yeah rock, rock definitely so that album came out a uh, gtr came out in may 1986 in the u.s and july that year in the uk um and just for context and a big thing that came out that same month in may was peter gabriel's so you know that's Which, a huge album oh yeah that album could come out today and it would be ahead of its time. It had Manu Kache and Stuart Copeland on different songs playing drums, but 
the singles that came out of that were also huge, huge video hits on MTV. I don't know if any of you remember when MTV actually played music videos. That's what the M stands <laughs> for, not drama. Uh, but the, <laughs> yeah, that was a huge album. So was, that had to be tough to compete with for anybody. Yeah, like In Your Eyes is like still a huge song that like sticks in my oh, yeah. like mental like player or red rain you call it you know all, all of yeah. those um uh what was the other one i get so and and the next one us mixed up sometimes as far oh as yeah you know. two uttered albums yeah which <laughs> I, I, love, I love but yeah that that had to be like well, how do we hold up to that because that album went commercially successful successfully commercial really quickly yeah, and so the tour that GTR went on uh, included keyboardist Matt Clifford because they realized that they needed a keyboardist to like do some of the sounds that didn't come through quite well uh, right. when making the record. Um, and Matt Clifford, I believe, is the supporting keyboardist when ABWH toured as well. Really? So, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Huh, I didn't know that. Yeah, and um, we can read these other two things uh, later. Like, let's talk about the album first. So what was your reaction when GTR came out? Like, when did you first hear about it? So I heard about it when it first came out. And the first song I heard was You Can Still Get Through. And that totally resonated with me <laughs> i loved that song bum, 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 bum. and i said this is going to be a huge band this is modern prog this is slightly commercial but it's still got those muso sensibilities and um i i just loved it i don't remember why i did not see them live um what year again would that have been 86 86 yeah. So your sister was being born that year, so <laughs> maybe that had something to do with it. I don't know. Yeah, maybe. But but uh, overall, I was I was thrilled that not only the two of them were venturing on in the music industry's eye, but those two together that yeah. that's almost a recipe for disaster because they're so <laughs> huge, you know. And and I don't think that had anything to do with them evaporating. Uh, but two, first of all. Two great musicians of any instruments in one band is like an amazing thing. Two amazing guitar players to be able to collaborate in the same band with two stellar backgrounds is a whole other thing. So I, I was thrilled. I just thought it was awesome. Yeah, and like we mentioned earlier, they had different approaches of how they wanted things to go. Yeah. But Steve Howe said in his autobiography that he and Steve Hackett are still good friends. So Good. Good. Yeah. And what was your first impression and when did you first hear them? I don't even know that. Yeah, so I first listened to uh, at least I, I listened to only The Hunter, um, or I guess it's just called The Hunter, and When the Heart Rules the Mind back in, I, I think it was late 2008 when I was browsing YouTube and looking at the stuff that Yes members had been part of that weren't yes and i was just like exploring like what they would do mm -hmm. um and i thought it had like a nice 80s sound you know i was like really getting into like 80s type music around that time um sort of looking at the old mtv music videos which you alluded to yeah. and i don't remember if i listened to the entire album around then um I know for sure I listened to the whole thing last year before we interviewed Steve Hackett, but yeah, I re-listened to it. And um, I have some thoughts, but like you said, you can still get through. We were sort of talking about this earlier, how it the later song from Union, uh, you know, the Yes album, Silent Talking, it, like this feels like a precursor to that in some ways. Totally. It's almost the same music, but with the note progression, the melody inverted or something. Um, it It's very, very reminiscent of that. And folks, I'm sorry that I'm yawning. I've been up for like 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and 
something that also sounded similar to me on the song Here I Wait, there's a bit where it goes, dun, 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 and that kind of oh. reminds me of City of Love. Yeah, yeah. I knew you were going to say that as soon as you started singing that. Yeah. I forgot about that. Yeah. Um, and I have like some other thoughts on the album, but like, what were your overall thoughts when you got around to like finally listening to the whole thing? I, I loved it. Um, like I said, I can't believe I missed them playing live, but ah, I had a lot going on that year with Victoria being born and just being a dad for the first time and had a glass carving business, was doing studio work, you know, all that stuff. But I do still think it's a great album and it holds up. I have a Jonathan Mover story that you've maybe never heard. Ready? Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. go ahead. So Jonathan Mover, other than being a great drummer and a great guy, is also um, the publisher and editor, chief editor of Rhythm Mag Drumhead Magazine, Drumhead Magazine. And back in 2017, 17, 18, 19, 18, 2018, 19, yeah, 2018, Drum Talk TV shared a booth with Drumhead Magazine. And um, so I got to spend some time with Jonathan, you know, both. And that's the thing that I love about drummers. Drummers just get along. You know, yeah. guitar players, <laughs> they turn around to do a solo so you can't see what they're doing. Rick Wakeman puts cloths over his keyboard <laughs> so he can't see what he's playing. Guitar players will cover up their pedal boards. They can't see. Drummers are so communal. And I thought it was very gracious for Jonathan and his staff to invite us in to share a booth with them for the NAMM show. For all intents and purposes, we're competitors. We're both in the media business. We both cover the world of drumming. But that's okay. Let's let's share the love. And, you know, we, we can share our audiences and we deliver something different to them. Um, so that was a neat experience, getting to know him a bit back then. Okay. I don't know if you knew that. Yeah, I don't think you ever told me. Yeah, if you look at the Drum Talk TV interviews, and they're in our playlist on YouTube and Facebook, if you look for NAM Show 2018, that booth, you can see a whole bunch of Drumhead Magazine stuff and the Drum Talk TV banner, and yeah, it's all in the same booth. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so... This album, uh, I do agree with, you know, we got a lot of comments and, uh, you know, I had to like curate, like narrow it down to just some, but yeah, we only have 40. But, We're going to read through them. Hang on, folks. <laughs> yeah. But, um, some of the comments that I saw, like, you know, there were fair criticisms about the mixing of the album and like, I totally got it. I agree with some of those criticisms, but I still think that like just from the start listening to when the heart rules the mind like it feels like such a i don't know if this will make sense but it feels like such a summer anthem type song like if you're like walking around somewhere and it's sunny and you're having huh. a good day and it's like putting you in a good mood type thing interesting um yeah and i also realized that the ending of it kind of reminds me of grand designs by rush but of, oh wow! Of, I don't remember that. I have to listen to that again. Yeah, the whole did 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 did. Yeah, uh, that I, sequencing. I think, yeah, yeah. I think comparatively, the Rush song is more refined. Um, but yeah, like I totally get what people say about the mixing. I think Phil Spalding, you you hear him better on the live recording, like in the live video, which I watched earlier the concert. Excuse me, um, and I'm going to show some more of that. And folks, when I show it, and I'll mention this again, when we show it, if it gets muted, if you're watching on the replay, just skip through it and follow the rest of the show because it's from a German broadcast, and we don't know if it was actually made into a product and if the algorithm will recognize it and mute it. So just hang in there. But in a moment, we'll show a little bit more of that. And by the way, no, I'll make the Max Bacon comment after we show the clip. Okay. Okay, cool. So do you want to show the clip now or um it's up to you. You wanna let's do that before we read the fan mail. Yeah, well I had other thoughts on oh, some of these ahead. other songs, but Okay, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, like I think the you know, some of it feels very eighties, uh, like 
people arena can rockish, say, like you were talking about. Yeah, but there are also some very beautiful, timeless moments on the album. I think "Till the Line" is very beautiful, uh, and yeah, also have Steve's solo piece "Sketches in the yeah. Sun," which had actually originated as a yes song called high which was made during the tormato sessions or really on, i did as a bonus that. track on that wow. yeah um and yeah and that song was also in asia in asia like asia play a song and then oh, it yeah. segues into that and i thought that was like wonderfully done on that asia in asia oh, video yeah, how yeah. it makes it feel like part of that same piece right. um and of course you also have hack it to bits that's really good um, and Imagining, I think, is a really strong closer for the album. So, yeah, I, I do have, like, my critiques of, like, certain aspects of the album, but I also have moments that I really enjoy from it. Yeah, there are a lot of albums that we've talked about a lot, and I don't think I've ever heard you say that's a strong close for an album. A lot of times we're a little <laughs> crit- It's true. There's a lot of times we're kind of critical about how an album ends on such a soft note, like Time is Time, Holy Lamb. Oh, it's Holy those, Lamb is a strong closer for that album. Well, for you, because you <laughs> love that song. But yeah, in, I know. <laughs> in general, I want albums to end with a bang. And I get someone else might have different sensibilities, but I think most people would agree they don't want the softest song to be at the end. I do understand how for a lot of period, a lot of people, and maybe like you, that could be the period at the end to bring it all down. But for me, I, I want it to end like a concert would with some, right? you know? I don't know. That's just me. But I've never heard you say that, that XYZ song is a strong closer. Oh, the XCS Zeppelin band, you mean? <laughs> I knew you were going to go there. Yeah. <laughs> Captain Acronym. Right. Um, so yeah, anything else before we show a clip? Uh, no, let's, let's show the clip and then we can talk a little bit about these other things we have uh, in terms of what happened after the album and then we could go into fan comments. Okay, great. And I'm just looking for the clip. Uh, so I'm going to pull up the clip, folks. I'm just going to jump to a random point. Again, if you're watching on the archive and it gets muted, just skip past it. We are not sure how official this is. Uh, but here we go. Check it. Uh, check it. Here it comes. He's a rival. He's my friend. Always winning in the end. He's a tiger. He's a swan. He's the one I'm counting on. Stake the glory. Steal that prize. Only the hunter. Only the hunter. Oh. That's interesting. I forgot this was on there. Let's watch a moment of this, folks. You may recognize this song <laughs> from Herschel Goldstein and the Bagel Slingers. In and around the lake, now it's come out of the sky. They stay. Interesting. Yeah. A little bit more. Oh, okay. (laughs) 
some really cool stuff there. You know, what I wanted to comment on was, uh, I forgot until you sent this to me, how really great of a singer Max Bacon was. I mean, mm. he he could have definitely, and I'm not saying he sounds just like him, but he could have definitely been the next Journey singer. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I think his voice fits really well with that. I'm surprised we haven't heard much more since GTR of Max Bacon because he's really a great singer. Yeah, I, I know he had some things in the 90s. Um, I'd have to look up what his discography has been like since if he, then. If he had a band with his kids, he could call it Max Bacon and the Bacon Bits. Oh, apparently he guessed it on Steve Howe's Portraits of Bob Dylan. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh. Yeah, he put he did um, vocals on Going, Going, Gone. Oh, well, he's a great artist in his own right. I would have loved to have seen him progress more in his career and land a gig with another really big band or form one because that dude can sing. Yeah. Um, and this concert, like when I was watching it earlier, I was really vibing with it. I was even sort of like dancing and nodding to it and ah. just seeing how Phil and the guys are like so animated. Um, there, there are admittedly a couple weird camera angles, like a close up on Steve Hackett's face while like playing is going on. It's like, why wouldn't you like keep Should... it not zoomed out and show the playing? But overall, it's a fun concert. It's a nice, uh, it's a nice showcase of how the music can sound live as yep. opposed to in the studio. Can you pop the YouTube link in there for folks and pin it? Uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and do that. Cool. Um, yeah, so after this tour, um, Steve Hackett ended up leaving GTR because, uh, again, the different ap approaches. And he found his next solo album, Momentum, to be cathartic since... He was more free creatively. Right. Um, and John Mover also left and ended up joining Joe Satriani's band. Uh, and I saw something I never knew when you sent a few notes. Oh, yeah. Nigel Glockler replaced Jonathan Mover. I know Nigel and I had no yeah, idea. Yeah, you've interviewed him. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know <laughs> that. That was bizarre. I, I was like, what? <laughs> that was crazy. You remember Nigel, right? Yeah, I remember. Yeah. Um. Like he's in, Sa he's from Saxon, right? Yeah, yeah, and he's still the drummer for Saxon. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so Steve Howe still wanted to continue with Bacon and Spalding, and like you mentioned, Nigel Glockler on drums, and they got Robert Berry, you know, huge musician in his own right. Yeah. Um, like uh, he, his voice is, well, it. We'll get to that later. Like, okay. but, um. So there were these sessions and they eventually got like circulated as a bootleg called Nero Trend uh, because uh, like a sort of abbreviated version of what they were calling themselves. Like according to Steve Howe's uh, book, the band at the time was calling itself Nero and the Trend. Interesting. Um, but things fell apart when Sun Arts, uh, which had been managing the band and had also managed Yes and Asia, uh, they offered Robert Berry the opportunity to play with Emerson and pa Palmer in the band Three. Um, and yeah, I was going to say Robert Berry's singing voice is comparable to like Greg Lakes and John Wetton a little bit. John Wetton, yeah. So what I, was he I think doing before GTR? Um, let me look that up real I, quick. I don't know cause... why I can't remember that, but I don't know why I can't remember who's president or what year it is. Oh, he <laughs> was in a band called Hush, uh, in the late seventies, early eighties. Huh. Um, but yeah, that was kind of a silly thing that happened. Like they knew that he was working with them and they were like, oh, you should work with these guys. And, um, yeah. But yeah, I've li I've listened to these demos for what would have been that second album, and some of it sounds really good. Uh, there's a great one called Running the Human Race, and I think that and a few other things ended up on 
Steve Howe's Anthology 2 collection within the last few oh, years. Oh, interesting. Um, and there was one called, I think it's called This World Isn't Big Enough, and it's very much a part, it, like it very much is, like it led to Birthright on ABWH. Oh. Yeah. I love that um, song. Yeah, that's that's a great one. It gets really intense, that one. Yeah. Um, um, I want to give a shout out to people that are watching. Uh, since you read comments, I don't remember where you left off, but I do see. Yeah, I didn't read Ingo or Anna's. Okay, or there's Ingo. Anna. Hey, Ingo, wonderful man and a great drum tech. Uh, Ingo, we got to talk soon. Let's let's give me give me a text me for a call. Let's get something together. And yeah, Anna Leah Vizzani or Vizzani, I guess it's Vizzani because you're from Argentina, not Italy. So it's hi from Argentina. Thank you so much, Anna, for following what we do. And folks, I goofed. We went live. This is all on me. We went live on Drum Talk TV, whereas we normally go live on the Yes Shift Facebook page and we simulcast to Drum Talk TV. But Steve shared it over to the Yes Shift page. Are there different comments there? Maybe, maybe you want to check that. Um, I don't see any yet, but okay. Yeah, I'll, so I'll be reposting this natively. But okay. yeah, those those dem those sessions for the second album, like you can tell, there's more work that would need to be done for them to be finished. But having listened to it, and like some of these songs are great, like uh, "Endless Nights" is one, but. I honestly think that this second album, could, or I guess it could have been a new album under a new band name if they did go with Nero and the Trend, but I, I think it honestly could have one up to that that debut GTR really? album. If yeah, huh. like it just like listening to these recordings just gets me hyped, and I, I think. So what's the biggest yeah. difference? Is it less arena rock and a little bit more heady? Is it more muso? Uh, no, it... it it still has an arena rock feel, but you, the vocal duties, like half of these are sung by Max Bacon and half of these are sung by Robert DeBerry. So oh. there's a little bit more variety oh. in that sense. But there are also some really great guitar solos from Steve Howe and uh, that I really like. And I bet their harmonies are great together too, Robert and Max. Uh, yeah, like yeah. I, I feel like... It's kind of a shame that like this didn't get made, but I also wonder like if this had kept going, like would would ABWH have still happened? You know, with Steve, right? Um, I'm sure eventually, whenever Yes would have wanted him back, he would have gone to that because Yes has been a huge priority for yeah. him. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. like in interesting stuff. These recordings. Let's um, take turns reading some of the fan comments from when you, when you were posting about this episode. Yeah. So John Sutton says, The GTR record was huge for me when I discovered it back at the turn of the millennium thanks to the How connection catching my eye. And it was also my doorway into Steve Hackett, probably in my personal top 10. And Phil's playing and tone was just fantastic. I followed his and Max Bacon's work into Mike Oldfield's Islands and Earth Moving. Thank you for the music and the memories, Phil. Cool. Yeah, so that's very interesting because, you know, out of the many comments I saw, you know, overall it was pretty mixed. But there are comments like these where, yeah, this album was huge for someone and it was their gateway into other things, which... It's fascinating because GTR was such a brief moment in time, but like, there you go, you know? Right. Oops. Sorry about that. What happened there? Okay. What? I lost my notes. I, I had them covering the screen for a minute and now I got a, hold on. Uh, why don't you read the next one while I figure this out? And okay. folks, you may see it cover the screen again. Sorry about that. Eh. Right, so Carl Parnell says, I saw them live in Memphis back when they toured together. Very enjoyable show by two great guitar players. I have the album as well. Cool. And Michael J. Clark says, Hack it to bits into imagining as a prog highlight sketches in the sun and the hunter. Cool. Yeah, Some favorites mentioned there. That's awesome. Come here, baby. Don't. Yeah, and John Pascar says, I saw them, not bad, but the kicker was how and Hackett opened for them acoustically. That made it a great night. Wow. Funny, I, 
That's Fu- neat. Yeah, and uh, funny, I heard when the hard rules of the mind on the radio a few years ago, I, w- I was like, no way. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Michael Jerry Kane says, what an album. Steve Howe and Steve Hackett together. Of course, I was more of a Steve Howe fan because of Yes in Asia. The guitar riffs were awesome and highlights of off the album. Highlights of the album for me are... When the Heart Rules the Mind, Here I Wait, Imagining, and Toe the Line. This is the first time I heard Max Bacon and instantly fell in love with his singing and fell along and fell along the same lines of John Anderson. Never got around to seeing them live, but heard a couple bootlegs and, of course, the King Biscuit Flower Hour CD. I used to listen to King Biscuit Flower Hour on 95.5 KLOS in Los Angeles, where I grew up. Uh, which, while it was good, was missing Toe the Line, which is my favorite song off the album. Later, I found the live album, which I think is a bootleg of the same name, Toe the Line, intact, and it's not disappointing live. I've never heard Phil Spaulding and Jonathan Mover. I've never heard of Phil Spaulding and Jonathan Mover, but they added a magical rhythm section to this piece. Cool. Thanks for chiming in with that. Yeah, and David Carlin says, R.I.P. Phil Spaulding. I still have an original VHS tape on the making of GTR. Oh, wow. Jeff, da- Jeff Downs produced this album, and it has some great moments. Max Bacon was a wonderful vocalist. Sad it was short-lived. I believe Steve Hackett resurrected When the Heart Rules the Mind on one of his tours with him self-singing the lead. He has quite a good voice as well. Guitar synths were in their infancy then, and due to some of the technical issues with them, GTR ultimately needed a keyboardist. Yeah, cool. And Jamie Golden says there was some great work on the record. R.I.P. Phil Spaulding. Yeah, and Tim Burnett says, saw them on tour. The material seemed to come off much better live. Both Steves also did an extended s- solo sets. Cool. And Jeff Barnaby says, I thought it was interesting. The pop tune they created when the heart rules the mind was cool. I really enjoyed the song, The Hunter. Cool bit of early 80s music. Then old progressives decided to get a bit into the MTV groove. Genesis included, by the way. Yeah, Jeremy La Follette says, loved that album and was introduced to Phil Spaulding's fantastic bass playing thanks to this great album. Uh, Dave White says, a great 1980s concert memory for me. They played the Wiltern in L.A. I remember that, and I missed it. Uh, Phil Spaulding sure jumped around a lot. I think there's a live CD out there somewhere, probably the bootleg that was mentioned earlier. Uh, Len Specht says, I've got the vinyl and CD. Wait, it's a dec- what's what? vinyl? <laughs> like a couch or... Table yeah, you, you just hold your ear to the couch and you can hear music, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's a decent album, but not as well produced as the bands I hailed from. I also saw the Steves on their GTR concert tour. It was fun hearing them perform Roundabout. Yeah, that was neat. We saw a little bit of that and just, just a little bit ago. Bruce Henninger says, uh, when this came out in the 80s, I enjoyed it up to a point, he says, for what it was, which is to say... If, did you just fart, Chanel? Where it says it fit right into all the other pop prog that was going on at the time. Asia, Trevor Rabin era. Yes, Saga. Saga, great band, I think. Emerson, yeah. Lincoln, Powell, Three. In those lean years before prog renaissance of the 90s, we took what we could get. Sorry to hear about Mr. Spalding's passing, by the way. You know, I think that Bruce's comment is legit because... You, people on Drum Talk TV have maybe heard me say this. You've probably heard me say this, that yeah, I grew up in my musical professional career in the late 70s, early 80s, playing part of that was in a progressive rock band that was a combination of Frank Zappa, General Giant, and um, <sighs> Super Tramp or Genesis, commercial Gen- something like that. And... At that time in the early 80s, prog rock was not happening in the U.S. It was in the the Scandinavian countries. It was in Europe and all of that. But here, it was all about the skinny tie or hair metal. 
And we were trying to do something that wasn't working. We played all up and down the Sunset Strip. We played gigs with Motley Crue, Great White, all those bands. And we were just some weird oddity that were too snobby to conform to what the trends were. And during that time is when exactly what Bruce is talking about was going on, where kind of real prog rock evaporated, especially in the U.S. And then it kind of started to come back around. And now there's a lot of really great younger and newer bands that are more like progish to prog metal. My personal favorite, no offense to the others, is Haken. <laughs> and we've had Ray Hearn on a couple times. Um, there's some really neat stuff happening in that space. So Bruce makes a good point. Yeah. And uh, real quickly, I want to bring up a few of Phil Spaulding's other credits, just looking at his, this list here. And there are a few names I recognize, which is really impressive. So he was on Elton John's Duets album from 1993, Mick Jagger's Goddess in the Doorway from 2001, uh, Joe Cocker's Across from Midnight in 1997. And apparently he played all the bass tracks on the Lion King soundtrack album. You know, the Lion King film is was such a huge thing for me growing up. And it's still like one of my favorite films well, of all time. It's really nice that you read through all that. I'm not familiar with any of that stuff, but I'm glad he found his way to GTR. <laughs> no, I, I had no idea of any of that. I'm a huge Joe Cocker fan. Love Elton John. Uh, I like Mick Jagger's dance. And <laughs> no, but the Lion King thing, that's huge. That's really neat. And there's Phil on the screen. Maybe if I shaved my goatee and, <laughs> um, and then uh, going back, we've got, uh, let's show, uh, here we go. These guys, there we go. There they are. Wow. Jonathan yeah, looks GTR so band. young. They all yeah. look so young, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. You know, um, we'll follow this story and we want to know uh, why, how, Phil passed, uh, but apparently he was very loved in the music industry. He played with some of the top, most legacy brand artists. When you look at Elton John, Mick Jagger, Joe Cocker, yeah. The Lion King, like those are those are dream gigs for any musician at any level, you know. Yeah, um, but by the way, I probably never mentioned this on the show, but I loved the Elton John concert that was put on. Dizzy Plus a couple months ago. It was very Oh, I did not see that. And you know what? I it. was so into our conversation, I also forgot to show this, the cover of GTR. Oh, yeah, the GTR album. Yeah. yeah. What, what do you think of the cover? You know, I hate to criticize when it comes to artists that we just absolutely love. I think it's kind of like a mail-in cover i mean eh, there's a guitar yeah, you can I, barely I, I read agree. the logo you know what i mean it looks too just like cookie cutter oh no yeah like i do like the idea of having a guitar that's shaped like the letters but i feel like with the dark colors and it just looks kind of the way it's laid out it looks kind of off-putting and kind of generic like i think more could have been yeah. done with this it's very um, 80s yeah, for better or worse. <laughs> I, I would have loved for all of them to be shown holding a guitar. Or yeah, I don't right. know. I don't know. There's something about it that's just like, eh. You know, there's nothing. Well, I know it was their first album when I was going to say nothing recognizable. But I don't know. It just doesn't do much for me at all. That's a stock image probably of a guitar. <laughs> you know, and then they laid the logo over it. I, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of imagining like how it could look if it looked more like the 90125 cover where it's like a computer graph looks more like a computer graphic like in that shape with more colors yeah or like if they got roger dean to do something like he, he could Ooh. make like a good uh, like a landscape in the shape of a guitar and the letters like yeah that, you know what yeah. though steve how having been of course in yes in asia he probably wanted his further of a pictorial representation as he could get yeah. away from those because you know? because if it was a roger dean cover i think people would expect it to be more proggy when this is more that's a good AOR. Point. that's a good point yeah. yeah any closing thoughts and and audience any closing thoughts where you're watching from where are you watching from what's your favorite 
GTR song? Did you like the album? Did you see them live? Who's your favorite member? Whose hair do you like the best? Who has the best <laughs> wardrobe? Yeah, so I think GTR, as brief as it was, like it, it was definitely a strange project, but one that I think was worth it overall. And like I said, seeing the concert footage of them performing together and how much fun uh, they seemed to be having and how like Phil was moving around, it was like really nice to see. And yeah. um, it's kind of nice to visit these like little offshoots that were like so brief, but still had something to put out. And it's not going to resonate with everyone, but it's it resonates with someone, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And that's how music and all art is. Art, whether it's music, visual arts, culinary arts, healing arts, it's very, very subjective. There's no such thing as the best or anything. It's It's what resonates with you. You can't measure something that's subjective like that, you know? Right. So, cool. What is up for us next? Yeah, so I think our next show is on the 15th at, yeah. did we say 3 p.m. Pacific? or It's at, wow, we, we have three shows that day. So we have, <laughs> we do. We have at noon, we have Dr. Nadia Azar joining me for our Drum Talk TV original series, Drumming Talk with Dr. Nadia, professor of kinesiology at the University of Windsor, Canada, a hosers. Um, so you can send in your questions while we're live and talk about you know, in injuries from repetitive motion from drumming. Great show. Um, and then at three, my time to Pacific. Sorry, that's our team meeting. At jeez, <laughs> oh, four Pacific, four Pacific. We have yes shift. Okay. So I guess we only do have two shows that day. Dr. Okay, Nadia, yeah. and then yeah. Okay, good, good. Yeah. So there are a couple different uh, possibilities. So. Um, it could be a news one. Like I, I did attend another John Anderson uh, Zoom Q and A thing, and oh yeah, there's there's also that Benoit David um interview that came out from Rolling Stone, which was interesting. So there could be like some other news things that come out. So it depends on like how much there is. Okay. Um, otherwise, another idea we talked about was like top ten prog, like people's favorite. 10 prog bands that are not yes and yeah. uh, i think you suggested that uh maybe each list like people could list five classic ones and five newer contemporary ones. yeah from yeah, like which, the 90s forward and before the 90s yeah i mean it's complicated because i think of dream theater as being newer but i think they technically started mid to late 80s yeah so, yeah yeah um, but, um also Something I forgot to mention, because you mentioned Benoit. Um, there's something when I heard Max, it reminded, of, you know, like today when I was reviewing the content. Yeah, Max Bacon. Yeah, yeah. I thought, you know, Benoit kind of reminds me of him. His voice. Yeah, I, I think I heard it a bit you, too. Yeah, Really interesting. I think it's more so in the the register, the power behind the voice is stronger with Max, but the the same vocal register is the same. The timbre is similar. And just something about the way these songs reminded me. That's yeah, interesting that you found yeah, that I as can't, well. I can't, I can't really describe it precisely, but they both feel like their voices have like an ah uh, in it. Oh, I don't know if that yeah. made any sense. But yeah, there's like a similar thing. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, so folks, so you can follow us on, yes, on facebook.com slash yes shift. We simulcast on Drum Talk TV. You can follow us on youtube.com slash at YesShift. And you can also, if you don't want to look at all this, you can follow us on anchor.fm slash YesShift, which is audio only, a podcast. And you can write us with comments, suggestions, donations. And there is a donation button on the <laughs> Anchor channel, which broadcasts out to the biggest podcast platforms. But you can write us at YesShift podcast at gmail.com and the dot is lowercase <laughs> yeah so keep an eye out for our post about the next show um and 
yeah, looking forward to what we have coming up. Uh, I know Oliver's birth, Oliver Wakeman's birthday is also later this month, so I'm sure we'll have something for that too. Oh, um, and we're waiting to hear about a couple big special interviews of people you will all know who we've not interviewed yet. And I encourage you, inspire you, motivate you, insist, politely demand, <laughs> to please go to the Drum Talk TV Facebook page and go to the button that says sign up. Sign up for our email list because, one, a new newsletter is coming out real soon, and two, there is a major announcement you will not want to miss something big that's happening in may and something along the way big huge nothing like it in the music industry please sign up and uh yeah lots of fun stuff on the way all right yeah so again um glad to be able to remember phil spaulding and to revisit gtr so yeah thanks for tuning in everyone thank you everybody we'll see you soon